This is lecture 53 in the FOA lecture series on fiber optics. This lecture covers fiber optic network restoration, finding and fixing problems. There are three lectures in this series on fiber optic restoration. Lecture 51 was causes of damage. Lecture 52 was planning for restoration. And this is lecture 53, the actual process of doing the restoration. In earlier lectures, we talked about the causes of network outages, the cable plant damage, equipment failures, infrastructure damage, mistakes made by personnel, and natural disasters. Now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty, how to fix it. A fast response depends on lots of planning, having some redundancy, having the right documentation, tools, replacement components, and some trained personnel. Step one is obviously switch to backup, if possible. Uh, you did plan on backup as part of your planning process, didn't you? If you have only one link that's bad, switch to a backup link. Use a different communication link in the uh, system, use a different module in the equipment, use different fibers and cable, use a different route for the cable. But switch to backup to get yourself back up and running so you have time to do the repair properly. The first thing you need to do is find out what the problem is. Troubleshooting uh, begins with deciding whether it's the cable plant or the communications equipment. Is the outage caused by the electronics or the cable plant? For the electronics, we want to look at the power. We want to look at connections. We want to look at modules and line cards. For the cable plant, we're going to divide it into three parts. Outside plant cable, premises cable, and patch cords. When you start with troubleshooting electronics, you start with the first thing you do with anything electrical. You check the power. You see if it's already kicked into backup power, which might have glitched the modules. You check link status lights and look for greens. When you start checking the fiber, we're going to check first the connectors to make sure they're clean and good and patch cords to ensure nobody has damaged them working around the equipment. We can check the optical power at the receivers and transmitters to see if they're within spec. As with all electronics, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to swap modules that are bad for spares. And uh, spares should have been part of your planning process. Remember after you uh, swap them that you often have to reset them. So you'll plug a module in and you'll have to reset it before it will operate. The proper operation of a fiber optic link depends on the optical power. You start at the receiver. Does it have enough power? If it's within spec, you're okay. If it's below spec, you check the transmitter power and see if it's okay. If it's okay, your problem is the loss in the cable plant. And what we've done here is basically do a loss test to determine if the cable plant is the problem. Troubleshooting the cable plant depends on having good documentation. You need to know how long each fiber link is. You need to know where splices are. You need to know the location of pedestals. You need GIS data that tell you where everything is. And you need cable and fiber IDs and test data from end to end so you can actually do your troubleshooting. Restoration requires a full kit of tools and test equipment. You're going to need to be able to inspect connectors and clean them. You're going to need a visual fault locator for testing short cable runs, a power meter, which we would just have used to test the power and the link. You need an optical loss test set, and you need an optical time domain reflectometer. And just as importantly, you need somebody who knows how to use them. 
Everybody in the communications electronic business will tell you that most of the problems are associated with connectors. So the first thing you always do when you do troubleshooting is you check the connectors. You disconnect them, take a microscope, look for dirt and damage, you clean them and reconnect them. And that's the, where you start with all the troubleshooting of the cable plant. The easiest and quickest way to test patch cords is to test with a visual fault locator. See if you're getting light through them. Now, there's two things you have to worry about. One is continuity. Are we getting light through this patch cord? And two, is it connected up to the right port? Uh, there have been many instances of people having systems that are down. They haven't been able to troubleshoot because somebody plugged the wrong connector into the wrong port. We even know of it happening when somebody was showing visitors around a communications room. If it's a cable plant problem, it's, well, basically time for the OTDR, assuming the cable plant is longer than just inside a building, where the visual fault locator will probably be better to help you. You start testing the link that's down. Uh, you access the fiber on the link that's the problem, and you look for the OTDR trace, look for the end. See if the length is the length you expect, and if it's not, is it showing you a break? If you locate a break in the fiber, test other fibers in the same cable to see if there's a cable problem. If it's only one problem, it's likely in a splice closure or a patch panel. If it's all the fibers in the cable, well, then you have a problem that's likely to be a cable damage. If your OTDR indicates you have cable damage, well, Actually, the first thing you should do is send somebody out to drive the route of the cable plant. Make sure they have the GIS data, drive the route, and look for people working along the route. If you see a contractor working in the area of the problem, well, you may have uh, located your problem already. It's happened many, many times. If you think you have a break in the cable, and you send a tech out to look for it. Remember that OTDR data is not that accurate. There's a discrepancy between the fiber length and the cable length, the fiber's longer, and the cable, of course, doesn't follow a straight line. So you shoot from both ends on long runs and average. That'll help you if a problem is not obvious from the surface, like construction, but underground from um, something like directional boring or a gopher. Remember to locate the problem with respect to the closest splice point. The closest reference you can get will reduce the error of your estimate of finding the problem. GIS data can be extremely helpful here, especially if your data also includes other physical location points in the area that you can use for references. Visual inspection will also show you problems when nothing else will. This is a cable that had damage. It was shown on an OTDR, but it wasn't obvious where the damage was until somebody looked up the pole and saw the kink in the cable. Damage in aerial cables can also be hard to find, and you're probably going to need to uh, send your tech out with a good pair of binoculars to literally physically inspect the area of the cable that you think is the problem so you can find things like bullet holes or um, physical damage that may have been done by an installer putting another cable on on the same messenger. There are cable locators that can help you find cable and other underground buried utilities in the region of your cable. So if you need help in locating where your cable is buried before you dig trying to find where that gopher chewed your cable in half, uh, you need to know how to use electromagnetic locators or ground penetrating radar. We've seen a lot of problems over the years with fiber damaged in splice closures. 
where the tech was putting the cover on the splice tray and uh, cracked a fiber. But it didn't show up as a problem until sometime later. Uh, you should always check the, the splices in patch panels and in splice closures when you can with a visual fault locator. That bright red glow will show you often that there's a crack in the fiber that you might not be able to find otherwise. Once you get ready to do some restoration repair, you're going to have to have all your replacement components, those leftovers from the installation that we talked about earlier and warned you to save. And you're going to have to have tools and test equipment to do a full repair and obviously trained personnel who know what they're doing. But you're probably going to be digging cables up and um, re-splicing them, you're going to need a fully equipped installer. They're going to need a full set of fiber installation tools, including a fusion splicer, and those spare components that we keep talking about. Remember you're not going to be dealing with neat and uh, clean brand new cables and splice closures and components, especially when you get into things like uh, manholes and handholes where you may find a complete rat's nest of cables and splice closures and they're all dirty from having been left there for way too long. So uh, expect to have to work your way through, find your cables, clean them, and do a thorough job of cleaning them before you start opening up splice closures so you don't cause other problems with all the dirt. Underground repairs may require more construction, digging trenches, installing more handholes, or burying new conduit. If you have a cable and conduit with service loops somewhere nearby, uh, you may be uh, in a much easier situation to do repair because you just put in a new handhold and pull cables toward you and uh, splice them. Direct burial cable, of course, is much more difficult because you're going to have to probably do two splices to splice in an additional section of cable. If you're lucky, you'll be able to pull cable from service loops to have 5 to 15 meters of slack so you can splice the cable directly. If you can't get the uh, slack, you're going to have to splice in a length of the cable. Remember that cable we told you to save from leftovers in the uh, construction process? and have to put in two splices. It's generally recommended that um, you splice in a length of cable about 100 meters long so the splices are separated and you don't run into uh, problems with transmission. Aerial cables can be easy or hard to fix. It depends. If you can just drop some cables down from service loops and uh, splice on the ground and then lash it back to the messenger, you're lucky. But sometimes you have problems like uh, the picture at the right where a helicopter cuts some optical power ground wire and a uh, tech that we know had to splice it at 150 feet in the air in the midst of all those high voltage cables. Let's just review now. The most important thing is to have a plan. Be prepared. Have a backup link or fiber route which gets your communications back up and running while you do a proper restoration. Have trained personnel on call who know how to troubleshoot and repair all the network. And after you're all through, do a cleanup. Put it back to the original condition. Make sure that what you've done doesn't affect the future likelihood of having to do yet another restoration. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the International Professional Society of Fiber Optics, and the recognized certification body for fiber optic techs. We have a thousand pages of technical information on our website that's available to everyone at foa.org.